Good afternoon, everyone. Judy Maggio. Welcome to Decibel Dialogue. And this afternoon, we're talking with someone who's been pretty busy, I would say, probably the last week. Russell Smith is the CEO of Refugee Services of Texas. And um, this is the only refugee resettlement uh, group in Austin. Is that right? It is. And you're we, statewide? We are statewide. Uh, Caritas uh, did refugee resettlement, but based on kind of the restrictions and uh, roadblocks that from the current administration, they stopped resettling uh, in September of 18. Okay. So, so you mentioned the current administration, the Trump administration. I, I want to give everybody a little bit of background about why we invited you here today, because it's been kind of an emotional roller coaster for refugees and I'm sure for groups like yourself. So mm -hmm. let's set the stage. Sure. On uh, First of all, the Trump administration has given states the power to refuse new refugees. Yes. Is that right? States and uh, localities as well. Okay. Um, and on Friday, tell us what happened Friday with Governor Abbott. Well, so um, they so there was an executive order from the Trump administration that basically said that states and cities and kind of localities would have to approve refugee resettlement. Um, an automatic thing. Yeah, and so then and they kind of then bounced it to the refugee resettlement agencies to figure out how that process happened. And we'd been really working pretty hard at um, getting in front of. Um, you know, governors are so the the network across the country. You know, have been getting in front of governors and uh, county judges and, and mayors, and um, up through last Friday, I think there was like 41 or 42 states had said uh, yes to resettlement, including I think at least 17 Republican governor-led states. Uh, in Texas, we had already received approval from pretty much every large metropolitan area, uh, you know, from Travis County and up in Dallas and in San Antonio and Houston, um, uh, even the mayor of Fort Worth and, and uh, the counties around Amarillo had said yes, absolutely, because it's such, you know, the, the refugee resettlement program um, is so great in so many ways and like bringing in people to the community that like add to uh, kind of the, the, the texture of the community as well as bringing in, you know, building economic base. Um, and then on Friday, um, uh, Governor Abbott was the first to come out and say no to resettlement um, in the state of Texas. And so some of the reasons I understand that he gave were that, you know, we, we accept more refugees than anyone else. This is this is, there, there were safety issues, tax issues. Were those some of the reasons he gave for? Yeah, that was, uh, that was the the we accept more than anybody else is an interesting thing. I think that's actually, that's actually a positive. Uh, Texas has um, resettled the most um, refugees um, of any other state in the country over the past several years. We're usually either one or two with California. In the last uh, couple of years, we've been um, the uh, most popular destination. It's just we're a very op uh, open and accepting state. And it's um, a prosperous state as it's well. It's a prosperous state, yeah. And uh, he talked about resources, but the interesting thing is that the resources are federal resources and that it's uh, like not allowing refugees to come into Texas does not then move those resources to other populations. It just says that those resources are not coming to Texas because those the resources follow the refugees they get resettled wherever they get resettled. So the governor made this announcement on Friday and there was pretty much an uproar on the part of a lot of humanitarian groups. I know Interfaith uh, Texas, uh, I know that the Catholic bishops got together and said that they were telling the governor to reconsider. But before anything else happened, yesterday a federal judge stepped in and what did the federal judge rule? Yeah, so there had been a lawsuit filed a couple of weeks back by uh, their national resettlement agencies, and three of the nine had filed a lawsuit to stop the executive order. Uh, and the federal judge yesterday uh, issued a temporary injunction against the executive order taking effect. So basically stopping the, the need for having uh, local and state approval for refugee resettlement. So in essence, the ban cannot be enforced while this is all tied up in court. Right. The ban that Governor Abbott wanted to put in place. Yes, on refugee. Okay, Absolutely. so that's, that's setting the stage of where we are now with refugee resettlement. I wanna dig a little bit deeper though and find out 
the definition of a refugee, because I think people are confused about the difference between a refugee versus um, perhaps an undocumented immigrant or an mm -hmm. immigrant that comes to the country. Talk about the difference between sure. that and definition. Yeah, so a refugee is somebody who's been displaced forcibly from their country, from war, from violence, from oppression. Um, and uh, generally, they'll end up in a refugee camp outside of their country. Um, and people stay there from a few to you know a dozen or more years. Uh, they will, um, uh, they can apply to be resettled in a third country. But of all the people that are displaced, the vast majority do not get resettled to third countries. The vast majority either um, end up back in their own country or they end up uh, resettling in the country that they in, that they fled to. Mm -hmm. About one percent of all refugees, and this is in the millions, there are millions of refugees mm -hmm. from their countries now. Um, about 1% get uh, approved to be resettled in a third country. And until this current administration, uh, the U.S. took the vast majority of those. Uh, and the, those individuals go through a tremendous screening process um, through multiple federal agencies uh, before they are, um, they are approved to be resettled. Right? Okay. So those are, those are kind of refugees. Okay. And asylee is uh, someone who has basically showed up to the U.S. on their own. Someone and seeking asylum. Yeah, mm -hmm. they've, they, they are seeking asylum. It's basically a refugee who's done their own travel to this country. Okay. Uh, and there's a huge population of people seeking asylum, uh, and a very, very small uh, percentage of them will actually be granted asylum okay. status. So tell us about the refugees that your organization here mm -hmm. in Austin and across the state where are these for most of these people coming from? Mm -hmm. uh, what situations are they fleeing and, and what do you do to help them um, resettle? Here? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so um, the, the interesting thing is like the history of the refugee program is a history of kind of the world in a way. So depending on the era, um, you know, back after, during and after the Vietnam War, there was a, a tremendous number of Vietnamese refugees, mm -hmm. right? So um, the largest, I was talking earlier about the largest um, welcoming of refugees under any administrations under President Reagan, it was from uh, individuals from former Yugoslavia mm -hmm. during kind of the conflicts there. Um, so th that's a, that, you know, that really world events uh, dictate kind of who we generally see and who we accept. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have seen um, in the last few years is um, a large number of individuals from the Democratic Republic of Congo, a large influx of Burmese uh, refugees, um, and we've also seen uh, a large population of Afghanis um, who are, it's, the technical term is special immigrant visas, and so that is individuals and their families who have worked with the, the U.S. over in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, at first we saw a lot of Iraqis, and then it kind of, with the travel bans and all of that, it's really kind of transitioned over, but, and we're still seeing a lot of Afghanis that are being resettled in our uh, communities. I understand that the number of refugees in need of resettlement worldwide has, has reached its highest level since World War II. Yes. So there's a, there's a greater need for people to find a safe place to be, um, but the administration has, has limited the number of people who've been allowed to come into the country from yes. the past administration? Yes. Is that right? Yeah, so it, it was um, the, um, under the Obama administration, um, and, and the, uh, the, the number is set by an executive order um, that um, the president will set out how many we're willing to accept. Um, I'll turn this off to make sure it doesn't beep. Um, <laughs> we don't want your phone beeping in the middle. <laughs> That's okay. And um, the, it had been increasing through pretty much every administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, it got up to, I think, a high of somewhere around 100,000 was the kind of the limit that uh, in the last year of the Obama administration. Then uh, during the first year of the Trump administration, he lowered that number and it continued to lower um, over the years so that his first executive order, I'm sorry, his first presidential determination um, uh, said that the U.S. would accept 45,000. 
they also, though, the administration set up uh, a number of roadblocks and additional steps and um, administrative hurdles so that in that year there were only 22,500 that were accepted. So it was just half of the, the, uh, the limit. The next year, which is just the year that finished last mm -hmm. September, um, the number had dropped to 30,000. Um, in that fiscal year. Okay. In that fiscal mm -hmm. year. And we actually, as a country, did hit that number. So it actually, even with a lower mm -hmm. ceiling, we hit, we had more refugees coming last year. This year, he's dropped it even further to 18,000. Um, and then added that additional um, barrier of the executive order, which would have then made it dif more difficult uh, for refugee, like uh, families to be reunified and for specific localities to welcome refugees. Fortunately, at least that piece of it has been put on hold for now, uh, but we're still under a presidential determination that uh, caps the number of people that we are able to welcome to this country to 18,000, the very lowest in the history of the program. So how many people are we talking about in Texas? While this, while this issue is tied up in court, you still will be able to allow people mm -hmm. to come into the state. How many people are we talking about that come in in a typical year who are refugees? Well, so I, I can talk from our numbers. You're talking because, about Central yeah. Texas in your well, group. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have offices in Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, mm -hmm. Houston, Amarillo, and a, a new site down in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and we typically um, resettle somewhere around a third of all individuals in the state of Texas. And interestingly, when I ran the numbers, we, on any given year, will resettle about 3% of all refugees coming to the U.S. through, through one of our sites. So it's about one, one out of every 30 or 33 or so people who come to the U.S. will come to uh, Refugee Service of Texas in one of our sites. Um, at our peak in 2016, we resettled about 2,400 individuals um, and in our site all across Texas. That has dropped um, to like 800 um, the following year. Last year, as like I said, it kind of weirdly ticked up a, just a tiny bit. We had about 1,000 individuals. Mm -hmm. This year, based on kind of all the new restrictions and all of that, our most optimistic um, projection is that there'll be about 600 that we will see. And since that's about a third or so, I would say less than 2,000 individuals in Texas um, across all of the different agencies. So we're talking a lot about numbers and lawsuits. Tell us about these refugees. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you want people to know about your work and the kind of people that you're helping and, and what happens to them once they resettle in sure. a place like Austin. Yes, you did ask that question. Yes. So like what, what, how, how do they, yeah, yeah, how does that even look? Um, it's amazing because one of the um, first things I did when I started about a year and a half ago was uh, went on an airport pickup. And what happens is that once uh, a family goes through all of the hoops that it takes to, to get resettled, they will be, uh, they'll finally be approved. They'll be, you know, They'll get on a plane that's like a two or three day journey. And so we have staff and volunteers that meet them at the airport. And, you know, they have, like, it's, a, it's called IOM, uh, the International Organization for Migration. They have these little white IOM bags, you can tell as they're coming down the, the, uh, the escalator at the Austin airport. Uh, and they simultaneously look completely exhausted and com just, just completely relieved and happy. Uh, and so we will bring people who speak their language. If they are um, there, uh, often a family will be resettled in a particular community because they either have family or there's a community of that, um, the population where they're coming from there. So we'll have somebody, either a relative or somebody who speaks their language and uh, there to help kind of translate. We set up an apartment for, for them. Uh, and provide them services and, you know, uh, English language classes and employment services. Uh, there's a small amount of cash assistance. Um, so for about six months, there's some intensive services for the, for the refugees. Um, and then there are some other services that we're able to provide for up to five years, and it's more intensive case management and some of the employment services. And so 
but generally refugees will, uh, they get a job, they become self-sufficient. We actually, as a nation, requ require them to pay back the travel mm -hmm. um, um, money, like what it costs to, to fly them here. Um, and there are requirements for them to get jobs and to, to be kind of self-sufficient. And we are, you know, and refugees do that. And they pay back um, multiple times what they um, draw in kind of um, assistance from the programs that we provide. Mm -hmm. They're also, um, they also open businesses and are entrepreneurs at a much higher rate than the general population. Um, What's one of the, the really wonderful things about my job is that our organization has a little over 100 people. A little over half of them are former refugees. Mm. And so in the Austin office, uh, I apologize because I'm going to get this number wrong, but I think we speak 23 different languages. Um, there's one individual there that speaks about seven, so that, that does skew it a little bit, but um, it is just amazing. And then just to hear their stories, to hear... Uh, what they have gone through to get here and how excited they are to be here. Um, we had the individual who speaks seven languages, his wife was finally approved to, uh, to join him last year and we were such a party and such a celebration uh, when that actually happened and he was able to reunite with his wife um, that they'd been separated for several years. This work has to be grueling for you. I um, mean, you, you guys are busy all the time. Um, is there something that really motivates you? I know your background is social work, mm -hmm. but why do you do this work? I love it. I mean, I, th I think it is one of the most important things that I've, I've worked in you know, children's mental health and in aging and in um, Head Start and uh, other things, but I actually sought this out. And as I was saying before, I was kind of a year and a half ago, I was running into the fire because I think that this is a critical thing. This is a moral and ethical obligation for our country to, to um, be able to, to be welcoming and to um, enhance the, the lives of so many people that are fleeing from such difficult situations. Um, I love my job because of like the people I work with, the work that we do. Um, it is such a fulfilling job there are um, anytime there are speed bumps in the in like from the administration or from kind of externally what I also love is how the community steps up and volunteers come out and donors come out and people just say how can how can I help uh, and that continues to give me kind of hope in humanity and you know I grew up in Texas and I'm, I'm proud of Texans and I'm proud of Austinites, and um, I just enjoy being able to connect people who want to help in places where they really can make a difference. Well, thank you for the work that you and your group do. We will all be watching to see what happens next. I know the legal battle will ensue, but for the, for the time being, um, I want to make sure I have this right. The executive order that allowed the governor to say we will no longer accept refugees in Texas the, the federal judge has said um, there's an injunction there. We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, right now, you will be accepting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, any idea of when this could all be settled? Um, well, it was not really going to be official until June 1st anyway. Okay. So, we're still trying to figure out. It's, it, things are moving very fast uh, and changing every day. Um, it seems to me that this injunction and potential appeals and all of that will move this to at least past the end of this fiscal year through September. Um, and the hope is that, you know, and we're able to continue doing what we do and that um, our hope is that the governor will, will come to understand how important refugees are to the fabric of our communities and our state. And will um, he said he would revisit this? Uh, we hope that he will revisit it and change his mind on that. Okay. Um, even if this is go going into effect at some point, we'd love to have the governor of Texas um, be supportive of the individuals that we resettle. Russell Smith, CEO of Refugee Services of Texas, thank you so much for coming in and thank sharing you for your me. work and um, what 
people in Austin uh, need to understand about the refugees coming to our community. Absolutely. And thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day.